the Travel Lane County Board will be taking up at Thursday's board meeting. And I wanted to run them by everybody here just to make sure and to let you know how I'm going to approach this. Uh, the first one that we'll be discussing is the transit room tax increase that has been proposed to legislation. It's being proposed by uh, Eugene's legislative delegation to raise the state TRT from 1% to 2%. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a permanent uh, increase. It will definitely increase the amount of monies that go into the tourism industry. 15% um, of it um, will be uh, given to the seven regional destination marketing organizations. We've had discussions about this. Traveling County has had discussions about this. And as of this, this afternoon, I don't think we even have come up with a decision. So we're going to have a discussion on that, and hopefully we'll come up with either a decision to support it or not support it or take no action. Uh, just so you know, the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association is on record as supporting the proposal. Um, they feel that a temporary increase and a fractional rate increase are not in the industry's best long-term interest, uh, but they are supporting the, uh, the proposal for a permanent increase. Uh, some of the objections to it is uh, there's a sense throughout the state that this is being done so the Eugene Springfield area can get a lot of money for the gearing up of the 2021 um, uh, track and field. Okay. And then the second item <clears throat> is the wine country license plate bill. Uh, it was passed in 2011 uh, primarily to... Um, uh, distribute funds from the, the license plates to the tourism industry. F Fifty percent of the funds uh, distributed as matching grants to tourism promotion agencies to promote wine and culinary tourism, and the other half is distributed uh, to the agencies in amounts proportional to the amount of acreage in each region used for wine and grape production for general tourism. Um, this legislation uh, session coming up, there's a Senate Bill 442A. No, I'm sorry, that's not the right one. There's a Senate Bill being introduced by the <coughs> Oregon Wine and Growers Association to change that from uh, the money going to Travel Oregon to go to their, their organization and use it strictly for... Um, tourism or for promotion of the wine winery and the culinary and not for general purposes um, so at this point uh, Harry Westland is, is recommending that we not support the new legislation to keep the money flowing to the um, travel organ and, and keep the division the way it is and keep it so that the 50 percent can be used in general tourism promotion so that's the, uh, another one. And then the final action item <clears throat> is in reference to our downtown Eugene Urban Renewal District. There's going to be a discussion. And I'll, uh, up front, I'm going to want to let you know that <clears throat> I will not be making any comments at the meeting on behalf of the council because it's still an unresolved issue here. If asked, I will ask any questions. I will respond as an individual counselor with my individual beliefs. And I will most likely abstain from voting <clears throat> at that time. But just to let you know that that discussion is going to be taking place uh, to whether or not to support the extension of the urban rural district uh, or to uh, take no action or oppose the proposed legislation that we have up. So that's just a heads up on those three action items. One d definitely affects us, and the other two indirectly does. But I just wanted to make sure <laughs> most of the time I travel in county meetings occur after our, our Monday or Wednesday meetings. I don't have time to bring anything up, but this time it came out early enough where I do have time to at least brief you on what we're going to be doing. Thank you for that, George. All right, city manager. Um, do we get to respond to that, make any comments of what we just heard? No, it's just for information. No. Thank you, Mayor. I'll just turn it over to Craig and Carolyn and Craig to take us through this presentation. <clears throat> Great. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, so this Parks and Recreation update is a continuation of council work sessions that we've had since 2010, um, updating council on the progress and challenges of our Parks and Recreation system. The last update we had was a little over a year ago in 2014. Um, you'll notice in tonight's 
I ask there is no action required tonight. This is informational and inspirational only. Um, we are certainly interested in your thoughts and in your questions, and we have time for such at the end of the presentation. All right, thanks, Craig, and thank you, Mayor, and Council, City Manager, for this opportunity to present about parks and recreation facilities. Last time we presented was in the fall of 2014, and the focus then was on the existing conditions of park and recreation assets. We described how an aging infrastructure demands for more parkland and increasing illicit uses, combined with shrinking operating and maintenance resources, have led to deteriorating conditions for many of our park and recreation facilities. The focus of today's presentation is on the future. And over the past few years, it has been apparent that what we needed to do was re-engage the community in a dialogue, not only about the challenges we face maintaining our existing park system, but about the tangible economic, environmental, and social benefits parks and recreation facilities provide this community. It has also been apparent that we needed a new vision for the future of the parks and recreation system, a vision that inspires the community to come together and see that by investing in parks and recreation facilities, we would correspondingly increase those economic, environmental, and social benefits that stem from this system. In late 2014, our team started to discuss creating a new plan for the Parks and Rec system, and the two main goals were to re-engage the community, to really listen to folks about why parks are important to them, and then to create that shared vision with the community about the future of parks and rec facilities. So we are now halfway through a planning process, and I'm very happy to report to you that we are well on our way to achieving goal number one, re-engaging the community. Of course, we have more work to do on this, and it will remain an ongoing goal. But as you will see in a short video I'm about to show, our team really stepped it up and stepped out into the community to meet people where they were, where they played, and where they worked. The project team did a phenomenal job gathering people's stories to learn about how Eugenians use their parks and recreation facilities. And the results are overwhelmingly positive. This community deeply values and heavily uses their parks and recreation facilities, wants us to take good care of what we currently have, and wants us to improve the system for the future. So the next step is to continue our dialogue with the community about what improving the system actually looks like. And this is what we will be working on over the next year and be back in front of council with specific strategies and scenarios soon. But first, we want to report to you on this past year's findings. And we'll start with this video about our community engagement work. And then Carolyn Burke will go into more detail about what we learned from the community and where this process is heading next. Thank you. How can we engage communities? How can a city share information, invite a broad range of voices, and really learn what people want and need? More importantly, how do we involve busy people with hectic lives and limited time? These were the questions the city of Eugene asked themselves when they set out to plan for the next decade of parks and recreation in Eugene. They decided to do things a little differently and surprised even themselves hearing from over 7,000 people in the process. Every 10 years, it's important for us to take a look at where we are, where we're going, and how we want to get there. And so it's important for us to really understand the community values by going out and talking to folks and meeting them where they live, work, and play. We have, in the past, used more traditional methods to gather information. And although we knew we had good information, we wanted to really better understand the best way to reach out to people who didn't typically go to public meetings. We took our show on the road this summer, and we went out to over 30 locations around Eugene, from parks to parking lots. We were at community events, we were along the bike path, we were at grocery stores. We were wherever we thought people were going to be in their daily lives. And we brought Little Red here with us, and we had conversations with people, and we had a lot of fun with them while we were doing it. We had a photo booth, we had a chatterbox, we called it, and people could share personal memories with us of parks and recreation in their lives. And we had free ice cream. And we just got to interact with people and learn what they care about. And what that allowed us to do was get a deeper understanding of some of the survey information that people were sharing with us. 
and really what was underneath all that and what do people truly care about. We implemented a lot of community engagement strategies through this process, some of them a little more traditional and some of them a little outside of the box. And the combined effort of those I think really spelled success for us in learning truly what our community wants. Because in these quick conversations with people, the information that we learned from them was so much more valuable, I think, than what we could have learned in a two-hour meeting that possibly a small handful of people would have attended. And so my hope is that the team of people that went out and talked to people wearing these shirts and, and Little Red here as our ambassador really changed people's perceptions about how they can engage with city government and how their voices can truly be heard and impact the planning process moving forward. Forward. We wanted to make sure that we were reaching parts of the community that sometimes can be underrepresented. Uh, so we worked with residents of affordable housing developments to encourage them to take our survey. We did that by offering uh, gift certificates to local grocery stores. We also worked with the local Latino community to make sure we were hearing from them. We know that they are the fastest growing part of our population and that from previous research we've heard that there are barriers to them feeling welcome in our parks and recreation facilities. We wanted to change that. We worked with the city's Office of Human Rights and Neighborhood Involvement with the University of Oregon and with a public engagement specialist to go out to where people were to engage them in creative play and have informal discussions that really led to some terrific information and findings that we can act on. We sat down with a lot of community members just in one-on-one -on -one conversations. We talked with stakeholders, we talked with our staff to, to get their expertise about what should be happening with our system and into the future. We combined all of this with some technical analysis. Technical analysis included mapping our system to understand uh, the geographic distribution of our services and what where the gaps are. We also uh, compared our system to other communities through benchmarking to see how we measure up. We looked at trends across the country, regionally and locally, to see what the future may hold. And all of this is combined into a needs assessment that really thoroughly explains what our system strengths are, what our challenges are, and opportunities for the future. One of the really important findings is that nine out of 10 people in Eugene believe that parks and recreation is important to their quality of life. So it's really important for us to be planning for the future of the system to make sure that it continues to meet the community's needs and makes Eugene a great place to live. Okay, so uh, you got a good overview of the process. Um, I'm going to give you a presentation now that shares a little bit more of the highlights of that process and also gets into the findings of what we actually learned and then tell you kind of where we're going from here. Um, and I, I want to stress um, that this presentation is really just the highlights. We learned so much in this process. You have the full report uh, that was in your packet that um, really does document everything that we learned. Hopefully we'll um, intrigue you to dig deeper. Um, and I also wanted to mention I did, we did uh, make a correction to that document after it was printed for you and we put uh, a uh, this page at your desk and let me know if you have any questions about that. And then an another thing that we did is we did an, an executive summary that we put in an online platform called Atavist. And this is something new for us. We were trying it out. But this online platform allowed us to use all the different types of media that we collected, videos, um, stories from some of our pop-up events that individuals told, maps, photos, things like that, really into more of a multimedia presentation. And it's pretty cool if you want to check that out, too. So um, this diagram shows an overall, um, the overall process where we have just completed the collection phase where we were gathering as much information as possible about the current system. With this information then, um, we will be building draft recommendations. 
Uh, we'll take those recommendations back out to the public this spring and summer. Uh, based on the public's uh, feedback, we'll refine that and bring it back, hopefully for adoption by the end of this year or early next year. There are really two major components of the collection phase that we did, both community uh, engagement and technical analysis. Uh, as you heard, we did hear from 7,000 individuals in this process. We're pretty, pretty proud about that uh, number. We used both some traditional and kind of innovative ways to, to get that, this information. And one, one thing that was kind of uh, interesting is that uh, there was a lot of consistency in what people had to say. Themes rose pretty easily, actually, out of this engagement. Uh, you saw that we um, did these pop-up events, and as you can tell, they were a lot of fun for us and, and for the people that were participating. They allowed us to get a lot of qualitative and really uh, meaningful information from people. Uh, an example is this uh, word cloud that we created just by feeding notes from our conversations from these pop-up events into this software program. And for those of you who know word clouds, the more times a word is mentioned, the larger the word is. And this is uh, from some conversations we had, and clearly there are a lot of positive feelings about Eugene's Parks and Recreation System. We also met with hundreds of uh, stakeholders of the system. These are people that we partner with on a regular basis or that are regular users or advocates of the system. We uh, just really wanted to meet with them at the front end of this project, sit down with them either in one-on-one -on -one conversations or in groups and ask them what they think we should be considering and what are their best outcomes for the future. We also did three separate surveys. We did one a statistically valid phone survey, and that gave us information about what the community as a whole thinks. Uh, we also put that same survey on our website and invited people to take it. Uh, we had a lot of people respond to that. Those are primarily, I would say, users of the system, so people that have an interest in it, and so that gives us their perspective. And then we did a third survey, which looked specifically at our pools and community centers and how people feel about them. One of the most important findings I already mentioned is that 90% of residents say parks and recreation is important to their quality of life. Uh, that just tells me it's important that we continue to steward the system and to plan for its future to make sure that we can maintain that quality of life moving forward. Um, we did reach out to the Latino community to understand uh, the needs there, and I will share with you those findings in just a minute. And we did some technical analysis. This included equity mapping. We worked with a group called the Trust for Public Lands, which is a national nonprofit that works to um, provide access to parks and recreation for all people across the country. And they are experts in this area. And they've developed a, um, a form of mapping that shows areas uh, that have good access to services and areas that do not have as good of access. Um, and so we did that mapping for our community centers, our pools, and our parks. And I'll share with those with you in a moment. Um, except for the parks map, that one is still in development. It's a little bit more complex than the others, so we're still working on that one. And we did benchmarking. So we compared our system to these other uh, five cities to just see how our system compares. We chose those cities based on their size, their demographic profile, and in some cases, their proximity to us. We looked at Springfield, for example. Um, and what we learned is that in some areas, we really excel such as in the number of overall acres we have at 4,300 acres, our system. Um, in the number of community garden plots, we far exceeded any of the, those other cities in the number of plots that we have, and in the miles of off-street paved uh, multi-use paths. Areas that we didn't measure up quite so well was uh, in pools. We had the fewest number of pools per capita and some of the oldest recreation facilities. 
that leads me to uh, share with you our findings. And I'm going to start with our strengths because there are a lot of them. The uh, first one is just that people love Eugene Parks and Recreation. <laughs> um, one of the great things about doing the statistically valid survey is that it allowed us to get a sense of how many people use our parks and how often they use them. We don't have turnstiles at park entrances, so it's really hard to get a handle and, and understand how well they're used. But um, based on that statistically valid survey, we learned that 50% of residents say that they use parks at least weekly. And when you combine that uh, number with the other um, uh, reported usage, that translates into 9.3 million park visits per year. Uh, similarly, 33% uh, say that they use recreation facilities on at least a monthly basis. And again, when we translate that and our other reported usage, uh, it looks, at, looks to 2.7 million recreation visits annually by adults. These are big numbers that even we were surprised by. But there is a long and strong history of support for Eugene Parks. It dates back to 1906 with our first donation to, that formed Hendricks Park. So this image that was taken in the 1920s of Washburn Park, which is quite frivolous and fun, and you can see Hayward Field in the background and Matt Court as well. And uh, more recently, uh, this community has passed two successful bond measures that have funded $52 million in capital improvements over the last 16 years. These improvements um, are things today that we could hardly imagine living without, including our 11 artificial turf sports fields, a renovated Amazon pool, 22 new parks, and 1,800 additional acres of parks and natural areas. Another strength of our system is uh, just the beauty and the connectivity that is provided by our natural areas. According to our survey, the most common reason people value parks are to enjoy beauty and nature. In addition to our own 4,300 acres, the larger context of parks and land conservation in this area is rich with numerous other service providers in the region. These include Lane County Parks, River Road Parks and Recreation District, Willamette Lane, the Nature Conservancy, McKinsey River Trust, and the Bureau of Land Management. This map um, highlights the connectivity of the system. I think this is really an amazing and unique part of our system. The uh, green uh, areas to the south represent the uh, Ridgeline Park system and the trail that runs throughout there. And then there's the uh, Amazon Creek system that starts up in the headwaters, runs through Amazon Park, through the center of town, out to the West Eugene Wetlands and Fern Ridge uh, with a uh, trail or a bike path along almost that entire uh, way. And then there's, of course, the riverfront system, which connects us to Springfield in the east, through downtown, up to Beltline, and hopefully in the future to the north of Beltline um, through the Santa Clara neighborhood. So um, uh, connectivity is something that I think many park systems across the country would be very, very uh, jealous of what we have here. And in many ways, I think that this means our system has really good bones. We've got a lot to work with here. Another strength are just the community-wide benefits that are provided. Health and wellness, personal growth, economic prosperity, community building, environmental health, and just a, a unique sense of place. A couple examples of this. A recreation program provided over 6,000 programs and events this year for people of all ages, abilities, and incomes. These programs are offered in the categories of youth and family, robotics, <coughs> athletics, seniors, adaptive recreation, and the outdoor program. <clears throat> Eugene's recreation programming provides services and experiences that facilitate social connections, and we expand access to opportunities to people that otherwise would not be able to afford them. 
We do this with the help of valuable partners, including the 4J School District, Bethel School District, Boys and Girls Club, Kids Sports, and the YMCA. There are scores of reports that show the benefits of parks and recreation on people's mental, social, and physical health. Even moderate amounts of exercise, like walking along Prees Trail, can have dramatic positive effects on people's health. And then there's environmental health. Parkland provides critical functions that clean our water, provide habitat for plants and animals, and provide protection from flooding. Our urban forest, which includes 100,000 city-maintained trees, clean our air, reduce stormwater runoff, and keep urban temperatures cooler. A 2014 report by Earth Economics values these services I just mentioned, plus the recreation value and benefit to property values, as having a $42 million annual value to the community. So those are a few of our strengths. And I, I could go on, but uh, time to move on to challenges. Um, these challenges in many ways are not new. We've been working on them for years, but the magnitude is increasing. First, there is the park maintenance funding gap. gap. And I know you've heard about this. Um, park operations has not kept pace with the growth of the system. We've managed okay. In our survey findings, a majority of people uh, believe that we are either well-maintaining or somewhat well-maintaining our system, but there are long-term repercussions to this deferred maintenance. The community recognizes this. In the phone survey, 96% of respondents said that it was very or somewhat important to adequately fund maintenance of parks and recreation facilities so they remain safe, usable, and attractive. Our listening sessions with key partners in the community revealed this issue to be their biggest concern. Stakeholders are asking for more resources to better support the system they love, including community gardens, ornamental gardens, trails, etc. Simply put, this is an issue that must be addressed to responsibly maintain the assets we have and to be able to grow the system to meet both current and future needs. Next challenge is around park safety and security. People generally feel safe in a majority of Eugene's parks. However, there are parts of the system where people do not feel as safe. These areas generally correspond to the areas where we have uh, a lot of illegal camping. This map uh, shows uh, red triangles represent um, illegal camps that were cleaned up this year by parks and open space. Um, and these areas where people feel less safe are where the red triangles are, are uh, congregated there along the river system mostly and to a lesser extent along the Amazon corridor. There were 715 camps cleaned up in 2015 compared to 600 the previous year. The cost of cleanup can exceed $250,000 annually. 7% of online survey respondents answered that they are concerned about the impacts of illegal camping and vandalism in Eugene's parks. In fact, these concerns really dominated the online survey results. We had 2,300 people respond to this question, and of those 1,700 individuals opted to um, answer an additional open-ended response to explain their, their answer. We've read every single one of those responses and we're very telling about how people feel about these places. And then there's downtown open space. Um, clearly there is an interest in downtown open space and the future of the park blocks in particular. Uh, we are working with our colleagues in planning and development and we're paying attention to the conversations around this table and we agree that these spaces are vital and important to our downtown and to the park system as a whole. And so it's quite timely really that we're having these conversations at the same time on this parallel path and we are uh, ready to take the next steps with our, our colleagues. Um, so we're, we're watching. 
A few um, positive notes on the um, safety and security issues are um, the Park Ambassador pilot program. This was a pilot program uh, we, we did this summer where we had folks on bicycles um, uh, pedaling along the riverfront system and handing out information and being kind of informal but official presence in the park. Uh, this program won a State of the City Award this year and by all accounts is thought of as a successful pilot and I think did uh, help people feel a little bit more safe in these areas. Worked real closely with uh, police department on this program. And there are other things that we can do including activating uh, parks with programming, with food carts and special events that basically bring people into these places to make them feel more welcoming and more safe. Another challenge we face is around our aging community centers, pools and parks. Five of Eugene's six community centers were built in the late 60s and 70s. As a result, most of these centers are outdated and lack the capacity and space flexibility to meet today's programming needs. Uh, this photo actually was taken at Amazon Community Center. This is the Wizarding Camp, which is a very, very popular uh, camp every, every year. And uh, because of the space limitations, it just gets filled up and overcrowded. And uh, it's, it, my daughter did this one. It was a really great camp. Um, whereas Eugene's community centers average 8,500 square feet in size, uh, most average uh, recreation centers today average 75,000 square feet in size. So considerable difference there. Uh, the city owns three pools. Two of those, uh, Sheldon and Echo Hollow Pool, were built in 1968 and are now 48 years old. Uh, most of the primary systems of both of these pools are beyond their expected lifespan and are in need of replacement. These include major systems such as plumbing, electrical, HVAC, furnishings, and even the, the shells of the pools themselves. This photo is from a Sheldon Pool in the, in the late 60s. Amazon Pool in South Eugene was expanded and renovated in 2001 and is truly the crown jewel of our recreation facilities. The popularity of the pool um, shows really the community benefit of expanding and remodeling our facilities to meet today's needs. In the first year after the remodel, attendance increased 72% and the community's interest has not waned. And then there are parks. The lack of ongoing maintenance and repairs have generated a backlog of park renovation needs that now exceeds $24 million. We've managed to extend the life of these types of amenities for many years, but eventually they will need to be removed or closed if funding remains limited. And the final challenge I wanna to talk to you about is equity and inclusion. Uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, we did um, do some outreach to the Latino community and one of the wonderful things about uh, that outreach is that we got recommendations that are really quite actionable and easy to implement. For example, uh, one of the most common ways that Latinos use parks are for family gatherings and picnics like in this photo here. And so we can easily do things like having more movable picnic tables, having in-ground barbecues, having uh, park shelters that are available on a first come first serve basis instead of needing to reserve it weeks in advance just to facilitate these kind of activities. In the uh, area of economic inclusion, during the recession, recreation was asked to increase their revenue targets by $600,000 as a strategy to maintain service levels and to reduce the reliance on the general fund. So we achieved that fiscal goal, but we also recognize that it can be directly at odds with the mission of serving low-income families. And indeed, our survey responses from residents of affordable housing developments did show that uh, costs is a barrier for participating in programs. Additionally, nationwide, uh, this, this trend is seen to limit access to recreation programming. And then there's geographic access. Uh, these are the equity maps that I mentioned earlier. This one is for community centers. 
And uh, what this map shows are the green areas are areas that are served by community centers. And the areas that are outlined in blue are areas that are not as well served by community centers. This primarily includes to the north, the Santa Clara neighborhood, and in the southwest, uh, the Churchill area. Um, the pool map tells a very similar story uh, with um, a lack of pool access in the southwest again and in the north. And in fact, uh, there is strong evidence that Eugene is underserved as a whole by pools, as I mentioned with our benchmarking. And in our stakeholder discussions and survey results, we heard that overcrowding of Eugene's pools is a significant issue that only gets worse in the six months of the year when Amazon pool is not available. So six months of the year, this whole area is actually unserved. So that wraps up our challenges. Um, before moving along too far, I want to um, also talk about some of the opportunities that we heard about. These are the most commonly identified things that emerged from our community outreach about what people thought were opportunities for our future. And if I had to summarize them, I would say it would be to build on our strengths. So these opportunities include um, to provide basic amenities and restrooms, People just discuss the importance of benches, and lighting, and trails, and very importantly, restrooms. In the survey, restrooms were actually the number one most important ranked amenity. Um, people want more of them. Also, more access to water. This includes both pools and the river. Uh, in that same survey, uh, safe river access was the second most important amenity identified. And then providing more programming and events in parks. Uh, the community loves the programming like the uh, Summer Fun for All program, the movie nights in parks, the music, the Shakespeare in parks, and they would really like to see more of them. So what are we going to do with all this information? We um, have extrapolated these findings into some key themes, and these themes will uh, really guide our work as we begin developing recommendations and priorities for the future. So there are five themes. Uh, the first one is to serve the entire community, to provide equitable and welcoming access regardless of geography, culture, ability, or income. Number two, to care for what we have, to ensure that basic amenities are provided and that, are, that they are safe and clean. Number three, to grow responsibly, understanding where growth of the system is requ required to meet the needs of the community. Number four, to integrate with other systems, recognizing the interdependence of parks and recreation with public health, transportation, land use, green infrastructure, education, arts and culture, and economic development. And number five, to invest in partnerships, to continue to leverage Eugene's assets and expand services to the community through effectively partnering. In Immediate next steps, we will be holding six public workshops over the next several weeks. We are going out to each one of the different planning areas that we uh, have identified. And we'll be presenting this needs assessment information and asking for people to uh, weigh in on the front end as we begin developing recommendations. We will be having uh, free food and child care. So we hope people come. And uh, as we move forward with the next phases of the project, we'll again work closely with the Trust for Public Land. Uh, one of their specialties lies in finding sustainable solutions to the challenges of funding parks and recreation systems. This is obviously an important piece as we move forward, and we're really quite pleased to have their expertise and experience. Um, and as I said earlier, another round of public engagement this summer. And then we look forward to imp moving towards implementation of a new system plan early next year. So that's what I have. 
Thank you very much. So you're looking for responses from council, and I have um, Mike first and then Claire. Thank you. I have some questions, too, I assume is appropriate here, right? I, you said responses, so I'm not sure. First of all, uh, fine job. Nice work. I, 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 the size of the report, the amount of work and the interviews and everything that went into it is significant, and it's good information for making important decisions about stuff that people really care about. Um, it's my opinion to say at, at first that um, this council, I think, has done a lot of things really, really a lot better, really well in the last few years. Um, I'm, I'm not sure this is one we've we've done as well as perhaps other areas we could have uh, we could have uh, that we've spent time on. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here for that. But in the kind of base level assumptions, I want to ask you. I had a couple of constituents send me a couple of notes and questions about this, and so I, I didn't. I want to kind of translate those with you. Um, page 81 of the report shows the 20-year population at 219,000 people, and my question is, where'd you get the number? Um, Envision Eugene doesn't show sh 193, so I'm just wondering if that's affecting our assumptions about service levels. Where'd that number come from? Um, <laughs> I have a cold, um, so my throat's a little locked up. Um, that is <clears throat> consistent with the Envision Eugene numbers, but we were just looking at um, uh, the city of Eugene instead of the urban growth boundary, I believe is why there's the discrepancy in that number. But I worked closely with my colleagues and in, in I know you do. That's why I was kind of <laughs> well because we have 150 when we started the process. We got 157, 158,000 people to 219. Mm -hmm. That's 57. <clears throat> check my math. We're talking about 34. We're only going to grow to 109. I mean, when we get to doing Envision Eugene, so I'm not understanding where why the numbers don't seem to equate. Um, well. Uh, I guess I'll have to get back to you on that, but um, my understanding was that we were just going to, um, uh, I don't remember. I'll have to Okay. Get to All right. That. Well, I appreciate that. I just wanted to clarify there. And there was another piece, too. Um, one of the things we don't do for the sake of assessment is, at least I'm, perhaps I'm wrong about this, but we don't include private parklands, we don't include private facilities in our assessments when you're talking about number of acres, so we don't include golf courses, we don't include Eugene Square Tennis, we don't include private facilities, isn't that correct? Um, we we certainly do recognize them as providing recreation opportunities. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We certainly do uh, recognize that, that they provide rec uh, recreation opportunities. For the purposes of your assessment, you don't count those as official parklands, right? When That's correct. To do the math. That's correct. We counted um, public facilities. Correct. So, for instance, River Road Parks and Recreation District. You include district. school district and all other governments yes. in the public number? Uh, not in the acreage number. Okay. When you ask people how and when and where they use parks, do you differentiate Eugene parks as opposed to other kinds of parks? Um, we recognize that sometimes people don't always know whether or not they're using a Lane County Park or a Lamb Lane nope. Park. Uh, I think that in our survey results, um, there is a chance that people may be uh, confused about which, which jurisdiction parks they're okay. using. I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding the answers in the appropriate context. Okay. When Can I'm I add to that a little Please. bit? We look at certain things like pools. You saw the, the geographic map of pools. We did look at the Emerald Pool as far as its service area because we know it's significant in North Eugene. Um, and if we look at things like sports fields and our partnership with schools, and we, when we look at that as definitely shared use um, opportunities with pools and, and with, with fields and things. So there's some things I don't think we count exactly, but there's other things that we're very well aware of as far as the impact on service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. I think I'm going to have another couple questions, but I'm running out of time, so will you put me in the next round, Mayor? Sure. Thank you very much. Would you guys lean into your mics a little yes. bit okay. more? Job is clear. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the excellent report and all the excellent effort and going out and talking to over 7,000 people. Um, that's really great. Um, 
I'm really heartened to see that the public wants our park system to be adequately funded. Um, that's good to know. I consider that a priority and plan to keep working to see what our options are to make that happen. Um, and I saw on the list of um, stakeholder listening sessions, you had Willamette Lane listed and Lane County Parks, um, but you didn't expressly list River Roads Park and Rex District. Did you guys interact with them as part of this needs assessment? You bet. Yeah. We did. We, yeah. we even, um, when we were out in the River Road area, we had, um, we invited them to participate in our pop-up events, and they did do that. Um, recognizing that we, we both provide services in those areas. Great, good. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate the mention um, as you were talking about, I, well, first I really want to acknowledge and appreciate the particular outreach to the Latino community. Um, I know that it's been um, a challenge for folks in that community to feel uh, welcome in our parks, that that's been something particular that's come out of focus groups over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, so recognizing that we have a long list of unmet need in our system, I really want to draw attention to the issue of making our parks more welcoming for our Latino and Spanish-speaking residents. And I want to ask if there's a way to expedite the creation and posting of signage in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised to learn that we don't already have that. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't seem like something that should wait for a big, huge planning effort. I know there's an expense involved, um, so I don't want to uh, downplay that, but I'd really like to see this particular gap addressed in an expedited way, because I think it's a significant barrier to inclusion um, and an issue that we need to address sooner rather than later. I don't think it's all right to wait another year or two years before we do something about that. So. Um, I'd like to encourage you to look for potential grants from foundations that are interested in uh, promoting equity and inclusion, particularly ones that are interested in public health um, and access. I think it's really important, um, and that's why I'm making that request now. And then lastly, um, you know, I was also concerned that we heard from women in particular that um, they often feel afraid to use our parks and trails um, in part due to the increase in homeless camping. So I hope that you and the city manager are planning to collaborate with Chief Kearns and his staff on how we can address that in a more robust way. The mayor, the city manager, and this council are working to address homelessness and to find alternatives to folk, for folks um, to, Ill to illegal camping. Um, so as we look at this planning effort, thinking about how we can help address this from the other side in terms of enforcement so because it really does have a, a significant impact on people feeling safe in our parks thank you Brown thanks mayor uh, well first of all thanks a lot for the presentation this is really a great uh, I think a very great summary that you've put together um, and I you know and I've been looking at the maps a lot and the first thing that that I noticed is and I noticed it before and I want to compliment you on um, your diligence in making sure through the years that all of these huh. parks are spread. I, 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 okay. okay, thanks. Um, how how these parks and recreation facilities? I'm working. I think they're all. <laughs> Mine's oh. working. Right, I'll speak up. Hello, <laughs> yeah. Other than hello, hello. Some, you know, special facilities. Uh, how, what a great job you've done in acquiring land and developing parks in every neighborhood in town. I, you know, they're they're really spread out pretty well, and we've we've discussed this before. You showed us the acreage in each uh, ward, you know, of the different types of parks, and there's really a good balance. Um, so, um, and you, I see that you're con continuing that idea. That's great. Um, then I look at the special facilities map, and I. Looking at the community gardens, and I know people that I have my own garden. Use somebody else's, they won't pick it up. It seems okay. like they're all starting to go off. Maybe it's just me. No, it's the X of the back, George. <laughs> that's it. Um, okay, so that's better. All right, I won't shout. Um, and I know several people that I have my own garden at my house, so I, I don't need to use the community gardens. If I didn't have my own garden, I would be there like that. And um, they're wonderful, and I know several people that use them very productively. 
Um, and then the information you provided, comparing us with other cities, we're way far ahead of other places. Um, I have family that lives in Denver, Colorado, that you may be f familiar with, with the Doug, Denver Urban Garden. Mm -hmm. They make us look like pikers. <laughs> and I think we do a good job. But I think we could do a lot more. And I'm looking at the map and I see that um, pretty much in North, there's none in Northeast Eugene at all. Um, none in at least the city owned property in, in Santa Clara and River Road. And I don't see one in Bethel. And really the, the one at Churchill is fabulous. I know people that use that. And, and the one by Amazon Park is really nice too. And I know people that use that. But south of all that, really there's only three in South Eugene. So I, I would just, and I know it's difficult to balance all of the priorities, but I, this one seems like this might be easier to do than some of the other things. And I think people would really appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna need another round there. Thank you. I don't think this is working either. I'll use my big boy for you. Go ahead. You have one that works? For the folks at home, brother. <laughs> is this working? Okay, good. All right. Um, this is really helpful, uh, really good information. And whenever I think about parks and recreation, something that occurs to me is you can't just talk about parks as some single kind of thing. When you look at the maps that show the acreage in Eugene, it's very easy to say this part of town has more than that part of town. Did it go out? Covered better than yeah. yeah. Hmm. One's working and one's not working. Um, when you talk about parks to a lot of people, what they think of is neighborhood parks or community parks where I can take the kids, we can swing on the swings, we can have a picnic. And a lot of the parks in the southern part of town are not that kind of parks. They're natural areas or they're trails. Um, and so we have a lot of acres there, but it's not acres that can necessarily be easily used by the average neighborhood person who wants to use the park. Another consideration is these parks that people can use on a regular basis with picnic areas and swings and play sets are very expensive to maintain. And so the cost to provide that level of park service is very high. And so you need the resources, as you put in your own report, to take care of what you've got. And the kinds of parks that people think of when you talk about parks are among the most expensive to take care of, and yet we have not provided adequate resources to do that. In fact, in the past, this council has explicitly dismissed maintenance costs when asking the public for money in favor of just acquiring money to buy more parkland without taking care of the parks we've already got. I think we need to talk about reversing that trend. We need to talk about the need to provide the people of this community with recreation capability, recreation resources that they can actually take advantage of. They can picnic, they can play, they can visit. Um, and that's what we need to focus our attention on. Just buying land and doing nothing with it is not how people truly can take advantage of their park services. So we need to change the paradigm, not necessarily from your level, but from our level in terms of what we are committed to supporting. And so we have to really buckle down and say it is now our job to provide the resources to take care of the kinds of parks people think of when they think of parks. And that's a more expensive kind of park, but it's one we have to commit to. When I've gone with you to tour our park areas, in-town parks, neighborhood parks, community parks, it's very clear we've not been taking care of them. They have been languishing. And that's been a conscious decision. Not necessarily your decision, but in many respects that's been our decision. And now it's time to, to change that around. And I think you now have people who are willing to take a look at that and are willing to talk about that. And I think that's a good place to be right now for us. Great, and I don't have any sound either, so there you go. There, there's a problem with just the transmitting system, so it's not an individual it's, battery. It's a whole system. Yeah. Yeah. I, I told you it's the x file. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so I, I'll, 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 use, I'll use my big boy voice too. And, and, and thank you again. I'll go ditto for a round of table here. I think you guys have done a great job. The three C's are hitting their mark. <laughs> and um, I I've got a couple of issues that I want to bring up in this, too. So I'm going to go back to one that you talked about and is called out in this document. It has been talked about this council in other areas. And that is the issue of park maintenance around the cleanup of illegal camps. 
So you threw out the number two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So my question is, is that okay? I've known since I've been on council the last three plus years that that number has grown and it's grown significantly over that time. Where is that money coming from in terms of where is it being diverted in the budget from other activities that are ostensibly funded by that money that's there? Because we're not adding any money to the budget. Not in any real terms, but you know we've got some more budget flexibility than we had two years ago. What are we taking away from the budget in other areas to support that make that level of maintenance for our park system. Council Evans, we're taking away uh, resources from our overall park operations and maintenance work, um, both in our natural areas as well as our developed parks. So that's staff time as well as some contractual time. For instance, our sheriff's work crew that we use regularly. Uh, we would typically try to uh, put the, that crew as well as our staff on doing a, a plethora of things from vegetation management to park cleanup. However, there, as the, the camps have increased, our staff time and those contractual dollars have moved over to camp cleanup and taken away from our actual cleaning up and t maintaining the park land that we have. So, for instance, so when people ask me, why aren't the lawns being mowed at Candlelight Park on a regular basis? Is that we take we take some of that mowing out of rotation, some of the other kinds of things. I would say that it affects our overall resource base for developed parks and natural areas. So yes, you could equate that, that it actually does take away from our ability to, to mow, water, light our parks. And the second thing is this, um, and uh, I, I don't think that we really touched on it, I didn't see it when I, when I read the report, was this, talking about uh, our potential partnerships, uh, for instance, the YMCA partnership and, and Bethel um, expanding our capacities in terms of what we can provide in terms of recreational services there, and also other public-private partnerships. And I've seen in other places around the country where you may have a, a foundation, we have a Parks Foundation, but that foundation needs to gain more capacity as well and uh, working with the private sector to be able to try to expand our um, platform, if you will, of services and capacity through, you know, partnerships with uh, the, the private side of the house. Where are we with having those kinds of conversations or initiating those kind of partnerships? So we're continuing to um work in those partnerships as we have historically. Eugene has historically with 4J and Bethel School Districts and even um, Girls Club and the YMCA and Kids Sports historically worked hard to maintain partnerships as we look at our system. So um, at this point we're still having those, those conversations one-on-one -on -one, even with Willamette Lane and River Road as far as what we're doing, what's the future, Here's our strategic plan. What is yours? Do they match? And so those are very important. Right now, the, the Y is an important conversation now, both in North Eugene and in South Eugene right now. It's a big conversation as far as how we look at what we do to serve our, to um, provide a great system for the, the people of Eugene. So I, I, I think we're doing a phenomenal job with our partners. Some of them are big, some are, are small partners, people that work with our adaptive recreation program or outdoor services, that whatever we can do to extend our services, we've been doing it and, and will continue to do it. We haven't tapped into to capital um, funds as far as building major um, um, facilities. I know we've done some with maintenance with uh, with trails and whatnot for the Prefontaine trails and the Adidas trails. So, but as far as a sponsored facility, no, not that I'm aware of in our, within our system um, right now. I think the the system that's getting a lot of that sponsorship is the U of O, and. 
that's great because that, that is also a player in our system, and we've talked to the U of O as a partner, but they're also very specific in who they're serving. So um, as far as sharing things with the U of O, it's, it's hard to say what the advantage of their system is as it serves all the community. Thanks. And we will be um, in this next phase of work digging more into the funding issues, both operational and capital, and exploring all of those opportunities. Thank you. I just would feel remiss if we didn't acknowledge all those sort of uh, organizations that part. Start. Um, I appreciate you are awesome.